Finding a great coach can be one of the most difficult and most important steps that you take on your bodybuilding journey. As a full-time coach of 15 years myself, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to help you ask the right questions of any potential coach that you're considering hiring. Today, we're gonna cover how to find some coaches that you can ask questions of, what those questions should be, what are some bad questions to ask, and how to know if the coach that you're considering hiring is gonna work for you in the long term. So let's dig in right now. This is episode 266 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining me. Darren Starr here, Five Star Physique. You can check me out at fivestarphysique.com or fivestardigital.com if you are looking for details on my own coaching program or workout programs on the former website or my online courses, Hypertrophy University, Macro Boot Camp, Bikini Blueprint on the latter. Also, you can check me out on social media at Darren underscore star personally or at the Drop Set podcast for the show. So with all that out of the way, if you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Consider liking the video, subscribing, dropping a comment down below if you have any questions or additional feedback. And if you're listening in audio only land, hi there. How are you all doing? So um, this show is available on pretty much all platforms. So wherever you want to watch or listen to it, you will find it there. We're going to talk today about avoiding sketchy coaches. How to find one before you hire one and realize like, man, this is not the right person for me. Um, just avoiding that entire situation. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, I've been a coach myself full time for 15 years. I have had many coaches myself during that time. Some have been great. Some have been lousy. I have had several coaching searches and had a lot of experience with coaches that I didn't end up hiring as well. So um, I feel uniquely positioned to offer a little bit of a manifesto on finding a coach. So that's what we're going to dive into here. First thing, um, how do you know if you have a sketchy coach? So um, like I said, I have had some in the past. I've also worked with a lot of clients who've had sketchy coaches. I've heard stories from them. Um, those stories you always have to take with a little bit of a grain of salt, simply because you're only getting one side of the story in those cases here. And so I'm always aware of that. Um, I know, uh, you know, former clients, what they might say of me. There's one case in particular where I know a former client wasn't happy with me um, because I found a testimonial from her on another coach's website singing the praises of that coach and talking about how her previous coach me, um, didn't provide her with post-show guidance and uh, an opportunity to reverse diet or anything like that, which I didn't because she terminated coaching immediately after her show. So there was no opportunity for that. So again, one side of the story doesn't really tell you everything. Um, so I always take that into consideration when I'm hearing things from, um, from clients who are looking at coming to me and they have things to say about their previous coach. I always kind of give the other coach, the the former one, the benefit of the doubt and say, like, yeah, some of this might be true, but also maybe maybe not entirely. So um, it's an avenue for me then to begin asking some probing questions of this person to try and get a little bit more information about them specifically. I'm less interested in their coach and more interested about them. So um, the industry, however, it is loaded with fakes. It's loaded with frauds. It's loaded with people who just don't have enough experience to really be um, a high enough a level of quality to help people on this journey as well. So just be mindful for that. And what I want to do here is talk you through kind of like the interviewing process, like how you would find a coach that's qualified, the questions to ask, etc. There are good ones out there. It can just take a little bit of work to find them. So um, I would consider, uh, first of all, what you need. And we can put this in two categories here. You know, there are coaches and then there are program writers. What's the difference? Well, a program writer is going to give you macros, maybe a set of workouts, and you're going to do that stuff. They're going to look at how well you do that, and then they're just going to make adjustments to that program based on what they see. They're not really interested in answering questions beyond the basics of like, hey, how do I execute this plan better? Um, so a coach is more about a troubleshooter a problem solver and you know all coaches should be program writers as well program writers you'll typically find these are the coaches that have double the clients or triple the clients of a coach because you can work with more people if you're not providing as much detail and in-depth insight to each person um, which to be clear like some people only need that um, however most people could benefit from a little bit more uh, and so I think most people really need a coach, even if they may think like, I'm in a position, all I need is a program writer. I'm good on the rest of it. It's like, are you really? Um, if you're a top level pro, 
possibly. I have known many top-level pros who still need the help of a coach. They need the guidance. They need the troubleshooting. They need the routine building. They need the problem solving. They need somebody who's digging in on the details that the the client thinks that they have mastered, but it's like, you know what? We can do better on this. So let's dive in here a little bit. Let's break down your routine. Let's find ways that we can improve this. Um, the main thing here is the the final quote at the bottom of this slide, which says, always be learning. So as the client, the person searching for the coach, you always want to be in a position where you're thinking about what else can I be learning about this? If you're in a position where it's like, hey, just write the plan and I'll follow it. It's all well and good, but... Um, the, the, I would say the best results from bodybuilding, whether this is for contest prep, whether this is just for a lifestyle transformation, doesn't really matter. The more of yourself you invest into, into the process as far as learning along the way and not just like, hey, we're going to refeed here. Why are we refeeding? What does that do? Like that's good knowledge to have and a good coach would explain that to you. Um, but also, how can I be better? at this. Um, and it's not so much just listening to what the coach says, because it's always also, I would say a lot of what I do as far as programming changes for clients is based on questions that I ask them and how they feel. So if you have a coach that's just like, here's your weight, here's your pictures, do this. There's a lot of detail that's getting missed there. And there will be a, a certain segment of clients that succeed with that. And those are the people who are basically just robots who will do whatever is asked of them. And, you know, as a coach, those are great clients to have. Um, but also the people who are genetically gifted. Um, and so they can do pretty much anything and a coach can just push and push and push and push them and they continue to respond and they look absolutely ridiculous as a result of that. And so therefore everybody thinks like, oh, okay, well that person has the secret sauce. No, that coach is just working with a client who just happens to be a monster. <laughs> you know, it, it, it happens. Um, the, what I'm looking for is can you take somebody that has limited genetic potential and has an okay work ethic, but teach them to improve upon that work ethic and blow past what it looks like their genetic potential might be. It's, it's really hard to know what's what. And so especially when you're trying to look at how much the coach brings to that process, it's kind of unknowable. So therefore, what we want to do is really dig in on some of the um, – uh, informative things that we can ask that's going to give you insight not only into how they approach things, um, what their philosophy is on things, but also um, let you see firsthand how they communicate with you throughout the process as well. So um, do you need coaching? That's the big thing. And I would say by default, you should assume that you do until you can demonstrate that you don't. So you want to look for a coach and not a program writer. So if you find somebody online, you're like, man, all these people have this guy as a coach. How many clients does this person have? Holy crap. Um, and you see this this coach online, I know people in the know have like two or three names at the top of their head right now. They know who I'm talking about. Um, and it's like every day this person is posting photos of a new client. And it's like, Jesus Christ, they've posted like 150 different clients over the past couple of months here. It's like, yeah, it's because they probably have 400 clients. Do you want to be number 401? How much, uh, how much help do you think you're going to be getting? That is a program writer. And they may be able to offer it a little bit of insight, but you can only be stretched so thin before the quality of your work starts to drop. So um, that's one thing where I've discovered that as a coach myself. I know where my limit is, and that limit changes over time. Um, as I get pulled into other projects um, and at, like when I'm in prep, um, my capacity for um, dealing with a higher number of clients drops down a little bit as well. So I'm cognizant of that and aware of it. Um, so again, if you think you just need a plan, chances are I would encourage you to rethink that and and find somebody who will actually be doing some coaching as well. So um, questions not to ask um, during this interview process of trying to find a coach and what can we ask instead? The first thing, and this is the thing that I just, I, I absolutely cannot stand this question. How many clients do you have? None of your business. <laughs> It's like walking up to a woman that you have just met and asking what her bra size is. Um, basically, what you're saying is, hey, tell me how much you make a year. Um, and I'm just not comfortable answering that question. And so I always dodge it and just don't answer it. And I, I would say somewhere between 30 and 300, <laughs> which is uh, uh, the high and the low end of that are never reality. But still, it's like, eh, you know, it's close enough. Basically, doesn't matter. What you should ask instead is, what's your turnaround time on check-ins? Um, 
I would say on emails, but if you can't answer emails same day, you got a problem. So that, that should be assumed. Might be worth asking that just to make sure. But what's your turnaround time on check-ins? What's the, what's the schedule? What's the process like for check-ins? If someone were to ask that of me, I would say when we first start up, I assign you a day of the week on the calendar when your check-in is due, and I will always respond 100% of the time by the following day at the latest because I don't put a time of day um, deadline on when your stuff is due. So I'm like, send me your stuff on Monday. Well, I'm not going to respond on Monday if you send it to me at 8 at night. If you send it to me early in the day, I probably will. Um, but I'll always respond by Tuesday at the latest. That's just my process. That's what I found works for me. So um, easy to answer. Um, what are your certifications? Another dumb question. We don't care. In the bodybuilding sense, um, certifications don't matter. Um, now, if somebody says like they're J3U Level 1 certified, that's bodybuilding specific. That might have some relevance. Um, it's not an official certification. Um it's not good for, you know, continuing ed credits or anything like that, but yeah, it's something. Um, but if like I'm ACSM certified or I was before I let it lapse, why did I let it, why did I let it lapse? Because it's worthless. Um, certifications exist primarily so that, um, gyms, uh, can insure you, you know, they can insure you if you have a certification through one of any number of, uh, of certification bodies. So, um, for the purposes of what kind of results can you deliver to somebody, certifications are worthless. You want to see what kind of results they've helped other people deliver. Um, how long will it take to see results? Another bad question. Um, my answer to that would be like, well, how compliant are you going to be to the plan? But even then, if we assume 100% compliance, we still can't answer the question. Um, as a coach, I don't know what's going on under the hood. Do you have metabolic issues? You know, do you have a really low basal metabolic rate um, that kind of defies all calculations? Um, do you have a low capacity for taking in food? You know, if we're trying to grow muscle, but you can't take in more than 2,000 calories a day just because your appetite is so slow, you know, we can still get there, but it's going to take time to overcome that. There's so many possible things that can gum up the works that trying to give any kind of reasonable expectation as far as what to result in a certain time frame is just a complete and total impossibility. And so people always ask me that. And I always feel like I'm dodging the question whenever I answer it, which is to say, I can't tell you, I don't know. And here's why. Um, it's never really a satisfactory answer, but all I can say is, you know, it's the truth. Sorry. Um, so instead, you know, what are your expectations for me if I attack this 100%? Um, that is a fair question. And it's still very difficult to answer. And my answer to that would be to get some more information. What have you been doing up until now? What's your diet been looking like? What's your training looking like? What are the um, results or lack of results that you've been seeing on that? And sometimes the answer might be, well, I don't know. You've been doing this. That seems like a reasonable approach. Um, you haven't been seeing the results, so we have some troubleshooting to do. So at that point, it, it's it, it's more about like, this is not a short-term conversation. This is now a long-term conversation because yeah, it seems like everything that you're doing is correct. So what's wrong? And that's going to take some time to troubleshoot. So if you're looking for a six, 10, 12 week transformation, it's not going to happen. And in general, I try to avoid those situations myself as a coach being in a position where we have to do something and get somewhere in a certain number of weeks with somebody who's just signing up. Um, like if you're signing up for a show and you want to do a 10 week prep, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, like it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. We might be able to do it. It just depends. Let me get some more information and see if it's something that I even want to do. I've turned clients down before because I'm like, I don't think you can do it. And I need, I need more time. I need more time. So um, short term, it's it's very, very difficult to make any. I mean, you certainly can't make any promises. It's difficult to even make guesses as far as what to expect in the short term, unless you have the ability to really provide a lot of information and context around that. Um, have you ever worked with anyone like me? Yes, we have. We have worked with people like you, I promise you. Everybody wants to be individual and unique, but we all fit into certain archetypes where you know, you can, you can assign a certain number of traits and characteristics to people. Um, and eventually like you've seen pretty much all of the basic combinations that there are, um, you know, as far as somebody's schedule, their physical limitations, I have this condition and I'm hypothyroid. I don't, uh, I'm vegetarian, you know, I can't do squats, what, whatever it is. It's like, there's only so many things where, uh, eventually you just run out of new situations to encounter as a coach. <laughs> So it, it happens. It happens. You work with enough clients, you've seen enough things. It's like, yeah, yeah. So the real question here is, you know, what are your actual concerns? Like as far as anyone like you, what are the specific things that we're getting at there? Ask the direct question. Um, you know, have you worked with anyone with, you know, uh, you know, heads or whatever, you know, something like that. So, um, 
what whatever like is it a condition is it a an autoimmune disorder or disease is it a physical limitation is it a dietary limitation um is it a scheduling limitation like oh my job is crazy i have like yeah i know i've heard it before yes the answer is yes um and part of that is just you know the thing is it's like if you look at the grand scheme of bodybuilders in the world you can find people who have succeeded in all possible scenarios. You, know, you have people who have Crohn's disease, people who have the most horrific work schedule imaginable, people who travel 25 days out of the month. Like whatever it is, you can overcome it if you want to. And so that question is more about you, the person with that situation, being in a mind space to where you know you can overcome it. It has less to do with the coach, unless it's a specific thing where it's a condition that has certain dietary restrictions or limitations, in which case you know, a good coach can learn about that even if it's new. So I still hear about new specific conditions all the time. Like, I've never heard of that. What is it? Okay, well, it looks like um, X from this can impart symptom Y, which inhibits your ability to Z. Um, you know, so then that's one of those things where it's like, well, this is how that is actually related to bodybuilding. It seems like it probably has a big impact on a lot of your life, but as far as bodybuilding is concerned, it's just this one little thing. So we take care of that. That's the only thing that I really need to be concerned with here. And then it's just understanding that whatever it is, it's not a barrier. Um, it's something that may increase the degree of difficulty a little bit. Um, work schedules, travel schedules being really the most impactful things there, but it's all, you can all work around it. You know, there are many, many top level IFBB pros who have horrific travel schedules, um, cause they, they travel for work or whatever. Um, so yeah, with, with good planning and with a little bit of troubleshooting and a good head on your shoulders, you can overcome anything. So some good questions to ask. Um, do you train clients in person as well as online? If you're, if you're looking to hire an online coach, you'd wanna know if they do both um, because they're radically different skill sets. And the thing to be watchful for here of is if this is a person who does both and they're sharing all of these client results that they have, are all those clients people that they see in person or do they get similar results from people that they work with online? Again, radically different skill sets. Um, communication is completely different. You're, you're not seeing somebody in person. Can you still teach that person what they need to know as far as like the quality of work that they need to put in? You know, if you're not there to like demonstrate it in person for them, um, does that ability, does that influence negatively your ability to actually get the results for them? So, and if you have somebody who does both, ask them, you know, what do they find different about online versus in person? And if they say not much, like, okay, that means that they don't work with a lot of people online or they're not successful with them because there are radical differences. So um, watch out for that. Um, how individualized are the programs? Keeping in mind that totally individualized isn't necessarily the expectation. You know, it doesn't have to be written from the ground up from scratch for you. You don't want to get a coach who, you know, sends the same plan to 30 people, but I've absolutely recycled meal plans before just because, you know, I, I have a conversation with somebody, I read all their initial materials, I go over their, their assessment, I look at their photos, I get all the details about their schedule, food likes, food dislikes, etc. And then I sit here and I stroke my beard for a second. And I think like, you know, they're kind of like person X that I've worked with in the past. So I'm gonna pull up person X's plan. I'm gonna copy that into theirs and then I'm gonna see if I need to make some adjustments to get it exactly the way that I want. So everything starts from something else, right? I'm not, I'm not opening up a new Excel spreadsheet from scratch and like, okay, let's format this thing. Like, now I'm always pulling in a template from somebody else. So, um, and sometimes I have had it where it's like, this person's plan is like, yeah, that's a great fit for where we need to go. And then based on you know, the first couple of check-ins, it might start to evolve and change very quickly. And then before long, everything becomes unique. It doesn't necessarily always start that way. That's just the honest truth. And that's a coach who's just smart and efficient. So, um, and I will tell people that it's probably too much information. They don't necessarily need all the behind the scenes, but I also don't want to say like, yes, everything is fully custom. It's like, well, it can be. And sometimes it is, but it isn't always. Um, sometimes like the diet that you need, I've written that diet before and I'm going to reuse it. I'm not going to write it again from scratch and change one thing just for the sake of saying that I did something new. Like that's just dumb. So be efficient as a coach when you can be, um, but be honest about it as well. Um, so if you are eager to learn 
about this process from your coach. Make sure that this coach is willing to teach, and you can infer a lot about how willing they are from the responses that you get. If if they're if you're getting short answers during this stage, this initial conversation before you sign up, they're only going to get shorter once you actually sign on the dotted line and you start the formal coaching process. You never you never get um, more detailed answers once you've made the financial commitment to somebody. It's human nature. Like they've closed the deal. Cool. All right, they're signed up. I'm going to get a little lazy now, and it's not necessarily always a conscious thing, but it is one of those things. Like you never get more detailed after that point. So just consider. Consider that the level of response that you get from somebody um, in the investigative period is probably as detailed as they're going to get. So it's, it's only going to drop down from there. It's just a human nature kind of thing. Um, can this coach help with blood work and lab analysis? I think in this day and age, that's a requirement. It used to be kind of a luxury. Um, if you can find a coach that can help you interpret that, wow, all right, that's cool. Now, no, it's expected. It's expected, absolutely. So, um, and I might say, I might ask the questions something like to, you want to ask a leading question um, because otherwise, you know, anyone can say, can you help with blood work and lab analysis? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And what you might say instead is, um, I'm thinking about getting, I, I, I'm scheduled to get updated labs. What panels would you recommend? And then you're, you're trying to find out like, do they know what panels I need? If they just say, oh, all of them, like that's a person that can't help you interpret that stuff. Like they should be able to give you specific, like, oh, you want a CBC, CMP, lipid, thyroid, hormone with free and total test, LH, FSH, PSA, probably if you're a guy over 40 or 45, um, you know, if you can rattle those things off, then you're in good shape and like, okay, cool. This person probably knows what they're talking about. You're kind of making some inferences there. If they just say, oh, all of them or the standard ones, it's like, nope, that's not an answer. That's not the correct answer. Now, a really good coach, this is asking a lot of somebody if you haven't signed up with them yet, um, would ask questions specifically about some medical history because there may be some specific panels that you might want. You know, if you're, if we're worried about, you know, cardiac health, they may want to get a calcium score or something like that. Um, it may be good to get a uh, echocardiogram or an EKG. Uh, if you have somebody who is a, uh, a, a long time anabolic user, you know, just make sure your heart's happy and healthy. Um, are we more concerned about kidney or liver function? You know, do we have reason to be concerned about those things? So that's something that I'll, I'll go into that detail with clients for a prospective client. Like I just typically don't have the kind of information that I need to, to answer at, at that level of detail at that point in the process. Um, I have specific condition or issue X. Are you familiar with that? And oftentimes the answer is yes. Like if I'm working with a type one or type two diabetic, of course, you know, I have insulin resistance, of course. Yeah. Um, if it's like, I have Steven Johnson syndrome, like, I don't know what the fuck that is. I actually know that's a real thing. I don't know what it is. Does it impact bodybuilding? I don't know. So I would go to Google. I would look it up. I would see what their impacts are. Like, there's so many diseases and conditions out there. Like, it's unreasonable to expect that you're going to find a coach that is um, well-versed on what you have if it's something on the rarer side of things. So that's kind of like a gotcha question. Um, but... In responding to that, like I get this all the time, like they have what? I've never heard of that. Google, what are the impacts? How's this going to impact us? And then I would answer back to that client in such a way. It's like, I have not worked with that. I've never even heard of it. But upon my research, here's what I find. Does this kind of correlate with your experience? Um, do you have anything else to add to that? Have you discovered anything on your own? That kind of stuff. Um, how do you prefer to handle communication? This is a big one. Um, I've worked with people before who are like, I'm not really good with technology. I don't like email. I just like to do, you know, I just need to chat on the phone. Like, I'm not your coach. Sorry, I'm not doing that. Um, my schedule doesn't support that. I'm not, you know, I've done that in the past. I still have PTSD from doing all phone check-ins um, and it, it, it scarred me permanently for life. Um, I will not be doing that again. So that's a non-starter for me. Um, if somebody says like, I, I really prefer to text all the time, like, I don't. So I'm an email guy. Uh, email, I respond with voice notes as well. Um, that's my thing. I'm a terrible phone typist. I will read text messages. I will respond via email. Um, don't send me paragraph long texts. Like, uh, I, it stresses me out to read that stuff. <laughs> like, if you have a yes, no question, text me. Absolutely. That's great. It, but also, like, because of my nature as, like, I consider myself a true coach, I have a hard time just providing a yes, no answer to questions. So you may have a yes, no question. I might not have a yes, no answer. 
uh, and I might want to dig into more detail. So, and it's just easier for me to do that on a full size keyboard rather than trying to type it all out on the phone. So understand how your coach prefers to communicate. Absolutely. Some more questions to ask. What's your approach to PED if applicable, if that's something that you're considering, you want to know if you have a coach that's well-versed in how to use that stuff. Um, how do you approach training in general? You know, what are your general theories as far as volume, frequency, um, exercise selection, intensity, reps and reserve? Um, are, are you okay with uh, improvising workouts if I find that there's like a really huge change in stimulus to fatigue ratio between two exercises, something like that? Um, you know, do you want to see videos um, of me so that you can see how I'm doing things, that kind of stuff? Um, What's your overall philosophy on diet? And the key here is to find out if this coach has thought about it enough to where they have a philosophy on diet. And I think most coaches with a good level of experience probably have thought about it enough and probably do have a philosophy. If not, I, I would think about running away from that, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, now, a lot of coaches out there will have a philosophy that differs from mine, and that's fine. And so if you ask a coach, like, what's your philosophy on diet? And their philosophy is, well, I'm going to starve you to death. It's like, well, that is philosophy that will probably lean people out, might not be the most effective one. And then you have to figure out like, man, I'm, I'm a hardcore badass. I can handle that. Yeah, fine. Cool. My philosophy, if I had to distill it into a 10 second pitch would be, don't time me on this. I don't know if it's 10 seconds or not, but um, if we're trying to build muscle in a growth phase, we want to eat as little as possible while still growing. And if you're in a deficit and trying to cut body fat, we want to eat as much as possible while still getting a proper rate of loss. Um, so basically, like we want to avoid the extremes until something more extreme proves itself to be necessary. That's my philosophy in a nutshell on diet. Does this coach, do they write meal plans only? Do they only do macros or do they do both or either one? Um, it's good to know if you have a strong preference on that. Um, then you want to make sure that like your coach aligns with that. Last thing you want to do is be like a hardcore macro person, sign up with this coach only to realize, oh shit, I forgot to ask. They only do meal plans. Fuck. Like that could be a problem. That could be a real problem. Um, what percentage of clients do you work with who are natural versus enhanced? Um, this could be a big deal. You know, if, if you are natural and insist on staying that way and your coach, uh, potential coach that you're talking to um, posts results of their clients and every one of them is enhanced, like that kind of speaks to something about what you can expect from that. doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. It's just something to consider. Um, if, if you're a competitor, I think it's fair to ask for a uh, competitive outlook analysis. This would be based on um, photos. I think I would expect it to be very, very brief, very cursory. Um, but you want to get a sense for like, does this person know what they're doing? Like, and this might be if you haven't competed before, um, send over some photos and say, what category do you think I fit in best? Um, and it might be that you don't know and you just want to know like, what's their opinion? Uh, or it could be, you know, I, you could also say I've competed before here, are the photos from my last show, like big picture, you know, two sentences. What do you think I need to do? Um, and you can, you know, if you got feedback from the judges after that show, you can compare that with what they say. And sometimes there may be a difference of opinion on that. That's totally valid. I've certainly disagreed with a lot of judges feedback before. Um, so, uh, but it's good to know that they have an opinion. And if, it, if it's just like, well, you just need to come in leaner. It's like, well, yeah, that might be the case. That's also a little vague. Uh, it doesn't mean it's a bad answer, but you just want to kind of see like, you know, what, what kind of level of detail they're putting into this. And again, if you ask all these questions of a potential coach, like even the most patient coach is going to get exhausted if we're answering like 20 of these questions all at once. So just be mindful. Like you can definitely wear out your welcome with some of this stuff. And this coach is like, God, if they're asking all this before we even start up, how much of a pain in the ass is this person going to be once we actually get going? So like I would, I would pick your favorite few of these questions and not ask all of them probably. Um, you know, how does billing payment work? You know, contracts, et cetera. You just want to understand the logistics of how things work. So now let's say you've committed. Um, what are the warnings? signs that maybe you've made a boo-boo and we want to try and get out of this thing if we can. So um, I would say, you know, make sure like if there are problems, if there are long-term solutions that you need, that you're working towards those and not just talking about them. I've seen this happen with a lot of coaches, um, be they, you know, therapists, life coaches, um, other trainers, other coaches, um, business coaches, that kind of thing where they identify a problem. They're like, yeah, we need to think about this. We need to work on that. It's like, okay, well, how do we do that? 
What are we working on? Give me some actionable things that I can do. Ask me some questions that I can provide answers on. On what do we do? Um, it's very easy to say we need to talk about this. We need to think about this. We need to work on this. But what does that talking, thinking, or action actually look like? That's the important thing. So you want to make sure you have a coach that's actually willing and able to initiate the action on that kind of stuff. Not just identify that there's a problem. That's the easy part. But how do you resolve that problem? Um, so uh, just make sure you're not falling into that trap. Learn to identify that kind of speech pattern, which is really kind of really at the end of the day, it's a stalling tactic. Like, I don't know what to do here. So I'm just going to mention that I'm still thinking about it. And then we're going to move on to the next thing and just wait for that to get mentioned again. It's not, not a great coaching strategy there. Um, if a coach just hands you a drug protocol, when you haven't talked about this stuff, that is a problem. This is something that happens. There's never been a discussion about PEDs, about performance enhancing drugs in any way. And a coach just says, here's your meal plan. Cool. Also, Anivar Clan T4, here you go. You're like, wait, what? I don't know what that stuff is. It's like, oh, well, yeah, if you're competing, you need to take this stuff. So here you go. Here's where you can find it, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's a problem. That's a giant ass red flag. That's a huge conversation that needs to be had. Um, and I would say typically like initiated by the client, like I'm never going to throw a protocol like that at somebody. Um, as I just recently <laughs> modified my assessment form to ask if PEDs are something that the client wants information on and they can answer. Definitely not. Maybe I'm not sure. Yes. Already taken it. So, um, at that point, like we've kind of broken the ice because a lot of people, they, they're interested in it, but they just don't know how to ask. They don't know if it's appropriate to ask. And so I throw it out there. It's like, here it is. This is the topic we can talk about. Do you want to or not? Yes, no, doesn't matter to me. So, um, but you know, I, I put the question out there, but then it's up to the client to initiate that. There's never anything from me. So, um, I just want to kind of make sure it's not treated as a taboo subject. Like they know that they can be comfortable asking me about that. Um, is there a roadmap, like a long-term roadmap? Um, has it been talked about? This may not be something that's necessarily written down. Um, I don't write mine down in the plan, um, but it's typically part of the assessment. So it's a, in a document that I can refer back to if I need to. Um, but also like I do a good job of just remembering what it is. Like I can remember with each person, like what are we working towards here and how do we get there? That's pretty easy for me to remember. So you just want to make sure that there's been a discussion about that and so that you're on the same page and you know what you're working towards. As far as a short-term target or goal, do you know what that is? Is that written down anywhere? Um, in all of my plans, it's on there, um, but I have clients ask me about what it is <laughs> because it's written down in a place where it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, but it's in there. Um, but uh, you get a lot of um, people, you know, as a coach, I work with a lot of people who, you know, they don't have a lot of experience to know, like, am I in a deficit? Should I be dropping body fat right now? I don't feel like I'm in a deficit. You know, I have a guy who's at 1600 calories, but he feels like very well fed. That's bizarre. And so he would naturally wonder, like, am I at a deficit? What should I be expecting here? And that's that's a, that's a fair question. Um, over time, you kind of learn and you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely in a deficit. Oh, I'm definitely in a surplus, you know. Um, but it's kind of trying to reconcile how you feel with what you, sh what you think you should expect to see um, either in photos or on the scale. And so just making sure that that's clearly communicated is helpful. Um, did they, Were they providing long and thoughtful responses initially and then they got really short once you signed on the dotted line, it's a red flag. Again, those responses will never get longer over time. The other thing I would say here um, before we get to the final section is don't be the problem. Um, so um, th this is uh, something that's always on my radar here. So um, a check-in is a communication and it's a, it's a back and forth. And if you as the client, if you're engaging in an offline check-in with your coach, all of my, all of my client check-ins are offline, meaning they send me their stuff through email. I look at it. I make changes. I get back to them. It's not an actual like phone or video conversation or anything like that. They're all offline check-ins. So, um, in that circumstance, I will often get some information, some, some data from a client. I'll have some questions. I might need a little bit more information. I might have some feedback. I might have some requests, things that would require a response. If I don't get that response, I'm going to get kind of pissy. Um, just because I am again, trying to move the conversation forward. I don't want to be the limiting factor. I don't want you to be the limiting factor. I don't want any limiting factors. So I want to have that conversation and nothing frustrates me more as a coach. Well, there's two things. First of all, clients who miss check-ins. Uh, if you, if you are one of my clients who's listening to this and you have missed a check-in, 
this is not going to come as a surprise to you. You know, that really like chaps my hide <laughs> and it's mostly an OCD thing with my calendar more than anything else. But also in all the years that I've had to coach myself, I've never missed a check in once and, uh, or come close to. And, uh, the thought of doing it is seems foreign to me. So, um, it's just a different mindset. Um, but the, the other thing that really gets me is when I'm asking a question and if I have to ask it again at next week's check-in, it's not a good sign. It's not good. And it happens more frequently than you might think because people are busy. I get it. You got stuff going on. You get this email back. Oh, he's got questions. I'll get back to it. And then a week goes by and you're like, oh, shit. I have had questions that have gone unanswered for three or four weeks. And I'm making the part of the check-in like, okay, I don't have anything for you here. This all looks fine. I've been asking the same question for three weeks. I need an answer on this because we're trying to solve this. And so I have to get to the point where I'm kind of being an asshole about it in order to force the issue. I hate doing that. I hate being an asshole. But sometimes you really have to be a bit of a dick in order to get your point across and get a response out of people. So don't make me shake you down for answers. Um, it, it does need to be a conversation. It does need to be a back and forth Oftentimes, I would say more often than not, usually. And I have a lot of clients who are really good about you know responding even the same day within an hour or two of getting my response. They're back, and so we do a little back and forth. We're good. We got that resolved. Awesome. We're both happy. Here's the plan. Here's what we're doing. Um, otherwise, though, if it drags on for weeks, I'm going to get real impatient. I'm a very patient guy, but it gets exhausted at some point. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, if your coach makes an ask or a request, um, don't make him or her repeat it the next week. Um, be open to feedback and be coachable and change is good. So I don't have a coach right now. If I was looking for a coach and I hired one and they decided that they wanted to change everything that I'm doing, I would be thrilled because what I'm doing right now has gotten me to where I am right now. And where I am right now is in a position where I'm looking to hire a coach to improve that situation. So I should be thrilled if they want to change everything. Now, change just for the sake of change isn't necessarily smart. There needs to be a good reason for it. It needs to be intelligent and informed change. But at the same time, like if somebody's like, hey, you should probably stop eating like a jackass. Hey, you should probably start training a couple more days a week hey, um, your intensity on this kind of sucks. That video that you sent me, like you had six reps left in the tank. What are you doing? That's not going to grow. Like that that's all great change. That's, that's shit that I need to hear. It's not stuff that I want to hear necessarily, but if I'm serious about making improvements and changing, it's stuff that I need to hear. So um, be open to that. Be coachable. When you hire a coach, um, I think it's reasonable to have some lines drawn in the sand. Like I will not eat fish. I think that's a reasonable line to draw in the sand. Um, if your line in the sand is, I will not um, listen to any feedback that you have regarding food changes on my macro plan, that is not a reasonable line to draw. If, if your line is, um, you know, I'm really serious about uh, transforming, I will only train three days a week. That's not a serious line to draw. Um, that might be an appropriate number of days to train for somebody, but if you're like, I want to do a show and I'm only going to train three days a week, that's not reasonable. Um, or I can only do 20 minutes of cardio three days a week. That's not reasonable. Um, find a way to get more done. Like the, the effort and the expectations have to be in line with the goal. So um, be coachable, be willing to change what you're doing. That's your responsibility as the client within reason. And again, if I'm going to ask somebody to change something that they're doing, I'm going to explain why. I'm not going to say, well, you got to change what you're eating here because um, I'm the coach and I said so. Like, I don't think I've ever said that, except maybe as a joke to somebody. Um, I would, I will tell you why. But, well, because I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about blood sugar spikes. You know, looking at your last labs, your A1C is too high, so we need to be very mindful about carb selection, carb timing, carb total amount. We need to think about you know increasing your cardio intensity a little bit as well. We want to bring that down. There's reasons why we might want to do some things like this. So. It's good to know what those things are and to be able to explain and articulate those as a coach. Um, so how do you find one? So clearly, I mean, the best way to find a coach is from this video, right? It's me. There you go. So link in the description below, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's, it's, it's an honest answer. It's also kind of a joke, but uh, I'm available. <laughs> kind of for a little bit. Um, ask for recommendations, people that you know, local people to you uh, that you know, um, you know, social media acquaintances online, you know, ask about their coach. Um, but consider, you know, whoever that person is that you're asking the opinion of, consider what they need versus what you need. And I think it'd be reasonable if you if you like, hey, Sue, you know, you're, uh, you've got so and so as your coach. How do you think about them? What do they do for you? What do you really get out of out of them? Not just like, do you like them? Yeah, I love them. They're great. Okay, thanks. That's not the question to ask. 
question to ask is what do you what's the best thing that they do for you um you know do you find that you know think of something that's important to you and a coach um you know if, if you're like are, you really need a coach that's going to offer you video feedback um, or feedback on videos that you send um from your training sessions like do you do you send them training video just training videos and do they give you feedback oh no i don't do that mm, okay cool let's see if we can find somebody that does do that is that something they even do or offer that might be a good question to ask so um what you need might be different from what somebody else needs um reddit threads um this is apparently a thing um i i'm in several of them i i, I only know that just because um i get um leads from my website all the time that mention that they found me or heard of me through reddit so um i guess they're out there i haven't been able to find them um apparently there's good things said there um but that's another thing, you know, that's Reddit is kind of like the, you know, the, the bullshit detector of the community experience. Um, it's hard to, it, it's hard for low quality stuff to thrive on Reddit. So um, Google search, the only problem there is you're finding people who have gotten good at search engine optimization. And I would put myself in that category. If you search for, you know, online bodybuilding coach, I'm going to come up in like the first two or three um, uh, search results there. Um the thing is, like being good at search engine optimization and having a great website doesn't make you a good coach um, automatically. It'd be great if that were the case. You've got to work on that. Those, again, separate skills. You, you can have a great coach who doesn't even have a website presence. Um, but, you know, as with anything, if you Google, um, you can get some options at least and you can find some people who, like, yeah, this person looks like they're kind of reputable. Let me request some information, start a conversation process, and don't be in a hurry to like rush to judgment. Um, consider also a coach versus a trainer. Are you looking for somebody who's going to be a comprehensive guide on your journey or somebody who's going to put you through workouts on a once, twice, or thrice a week basis? Those are very different things. Some trainers do coaching as well. A little bit more rare, for sure. Um, so what do you need more? You know, Do you need somebody who can put you through workouts realistically, most people with a decent level of experience can do that themselves. Um, or do you need somebody that has more of a comprehensive plan and can provide input on your workouts by constructing them, giving you feedback on them, etc. cetera. Um, I think for people that have even a reasonable level of experience, that's probably a good way to do it because most trainers that I've seen, and I hate to say this, I used to be a trainer. I know there's some good ones out there. Most of them are not good. Um, not good for a serious athlete who's looking to make significant changes in their body or looking to compete. Most trainers are just not cut out for that. They're accountability machines, which means that, you know, they just by virtue of them being there and waiting for you, you're more likely to show up for your workout. There's a certain set of the population of the gym going population, let's call them 70 to 80 percent of the gym going population that has a trainer for that reason, because, oh, it's somebody there waiting for my workout. I guess I have to go. Not useful, not useful. Um, and uh, by uh, certainly a lot of them are glorified rep counters. Um, when was the last time? I saw a trainer who actually corrected somebody's form mid set. I don't know. You know, I, I when I was traveling in Oregon t back in May, um, I was working out at a gym there, and one of the trainers in there seemed like a pretty hardcore kind of guy. You know, very deliberate about counting the guy's reps. One, two, three, four. I'm like, shut up. Like, you don't need to do that on every set. He's probably counting in his head, dude. Like, and that's really the only value that he was bringing. Like, and. Like I was watching this guy train and his form was not good. Was there a single correction made? No, not a single correction was made the entire workout. Uh, and it, it kills me to see that because executing things properly and finding those very obvious flaws in your form and execution is the job that you have as a trainer in person. It's like the easiest thing in the world to do. It's the one thing that I wish I could do with all my clients that I'm working remotely with, but I can't, it's just not practical. So, um, the problem is you don't really know what you're getting with a, a trainer like that until you start with them. And so if you do hire a trainer, just do it contract free. Like, Hey, can we just do a couple sessions just as one offs? So I just need to see if we vibe, if you're kind of what I'm looking for. If they're like, Oh, it's gotta be, you know, three months, six months, a year, whatever. It's like, just walk away from that. Don't make that commitment. Don't do it. So, um, and don't go with who is convenient and local to you simply because they are there. Um, we live in a day and age where, um, you can get a high quality level of coaching from somebody anywhere in the world. Doesn't even have to be if you're if you're in the states. Doesn't have to be in the states. Your coach can be anywhere. And so, with that much available to you, you don't have to settle with oh well, this person's local and I can see him in person every now and then. It's like yeah, that doesn't mean that that's a good choice. So, um, 
lots of things to consider here. So certainly if you have questions, um, if you are looking for a coach, seriously, link is in the description below. You can find me through my website. We can talk about it, see if it's a good fit. I don't pretend that I'm a good fit for everybody, but I think I can be pretty malleable and be a good fit for most people. So uh, that's all I've got for today. So I thank you all for watching, hanging out with me here on YouTube or in podcast land, wherever you are. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. Um, subscribe to the podcast on whatever app you're listening. Leave a star rating and a review if you're able to on whatever your platform allows. I thank you all very much. This has been 266. We'll be back here for 267 next week.